I'd like to introduce you to the first of our major communication theorists. This is Claude Elwood Shannon, considered to be the father of information theory and one of the sexiest men alive. Oh, could you imagine waking up to that, seeing those eyes look at you in the morning? In 1948, Claude Elwood Shannon writes a pivotal article referred to as the Mathematical Theory of Communication. And inside of this article, even though it's talking about a number of different mathematical concepts and yeah, Markov chains and zero-sum integers and all different kinds of weird mathematical proofs, he introduces a number of different terms that are very key to this communication class. And this first lecture will be based primarily upon his work. Primarily, he talks about a number of different issues, specifically things like a signal to a noise ratio, or the fact that messages have meaning, and oftentimes what we communicate across isn't necessarily interpreted in that same kind of framework. But most importantly, one of the biggest things he puts forward is the first actual model of how communication takes place. Now remember, in 1948, Shannon is primarily trying to deal with telephone lines, telegraph lines, how a person uses some kind of transmitter, i.e. a phone, sends that message across to a receiver, and how that influenced message gets a lot of different noise or signal degradation or a number of other problems that actually happen in the transmission of the communication message itself. Also, in addition to that, how the receiver gets the information to you folks as actual listeners. So though this may be sort of a technological concept, the concept of the source message channel receiver model of human communication is still applicable even in today's classes. So today I'd like to take a second and really break it down to show you some of the pitfalls that we can have in human communication. Oh yeah, you love that, huh? Oh man, I miss that. Jeez, the old classroom throwing up the old rope. So here is the source message channel receiver model of human communication. Now, we all work as sources or speakers, and as you folks are delivering your speeches later on in this class, you're going to try to be the best speakers ever. You'll be sending some kind of message, your speech that you've written out with tons of research and a great outline, that'll go through some kind of channel. Unfortunately, it'll probably be in this Zoom interface that we have right now. And eventually that message will get down to us as receivers or listeners or as a collective audience where we decode that actual message. So let's take this apart part by part. First, and forgive my crude drawing of a brain here, we all encode messages. So inside of your minds right now, you have tons of neural synapses, axons, dendrites, things that are firing off. All a gigantic com computational storm, if you will, inside of your own brain. Eventually, all these different types of neuronal firings and things that are going back and forth encodes into some kind of language. You take those ideas, you take those different thoughts, and you translate them into a language structure that other people can understand. We collectively refer to this process as encoding. Now, when we encode a message, it's subject to a number of different static characteristics. Now, these all can be changed, but for most of us, we probably already have a default set as we walk into this class. For some of us, we have a level of credibility or ethos. Ethos, you'll be hearing this term a lot throughout the course of this class, because I love Aristotle. Now, your credibility or your perceived goodwill, competence, character, all these things collectively sort of create your persona, if you will, that comes across to a particular audience. Now, for some of you folks, if you're thinking, like let's say about all your friends, you probably have that one friend that you just always believe that they, they always know what they're talking about, they seem well-researched. Heck, maybe one of you folks is actually that friend in that particular group that everybody goes to for advice or information or these kinds of things because you might naturally have just a high level of ethos or credibility as a particular speaker. We all have different levels of knowledge. Now these, of course, can change from topic to topic, but for every topic out there, you have a baseline of knowledge about it. You can learn more, you can read books, you can go to Wikipedia pages, you can go into the library databases, but we can all increase or decrease our knowledge about a particular issue. But at the start, when we're encoding a message, we have a baseline level of knowledge. We also usually have a baseline level of nonverbal communication. So some of us tend to talk a little bit with our hands, some of us maybe not so much. We can change this, you can practice more, you can think about different types of hand gestures you can use with a particular audience that's out there, but for most of us, we have certain nonverbal mannerisms that we take into every communication situation. Next, we have what we call a sensitivity uh, towards the audience in and of itself. 
So some of us are very sensitive to knowing where our audience is and trying to feel out who they are or who's paying the most attention at any given point in time. And some of us, maybe not. I don't know about you folks, but maybe you've got that one friend, they call you up on the phone, they wanna talk, they start talking. You can pretty much put that phone down, you know, go over, start making yourself a sandwich, chill for a second, ponder life, come back, grab the phone, and they're still talking. Right? They had no idea that you stopped listening to them. Or maybe you've got someone on the other side, right? That if you're listening to them and you break concentration for just even a second, they're like, hey, are you still listening to me? Eh? Folks got one of those friends? Oh boy. <laughs> Ex-girlfriend number four. Uh, finally, of course, we have a level of dynamism or perceived energy in front of other individuals. Now, there's a lot of interesting research that we'll talk about, about that's related to what we call the emotional contagion effect. That if a person smiles, if they come forward, if they have an open body posture, these loving kinds of nonverbal communication moments actually come across to the audience in powerful kinds of ways. And that perceived energy can actually spill over. That as I smile, you feel a little bit better. That as I give you more eye contact and that hearty grin, you actually feel it. That our emotions actually do fall over into people inside of the audience, even inside of this crazy sort of professor in a box kind of framework. Now, these all can be changed. You know, you can practice and you can add more energy to your delivery style. You can think more about your audience. You can change your nonverbal behaviors. But now that you know about them, we can start to work on them. So now that we've sent the message from the source, we actually can talk a little bit about the message itself. Now, the message has a number of different components. We've been socialized into tons of different aspects of the message, but specifically, I'd like to talk about a few. First, there's what we call feed forwarding. So a lot of times, when we walk into a public speaking situation, students oftentimes start off by saying, hello, my name is Kasim. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the source message channel receiver model. I'm trying to call attention to it. You know, oftentimes we're trained to say, hey, well, wait a second, get the audience primed so you can listen to them. I don't recommend that for this speech, but oftentimes we engage in feed forward messages or even what we call phatic communication that sometimes uh, we engage in small talk. Even before we talk to one of our closest friends, we might be like, oh, hey, how's it going? What up? How you doing? These kinds of things to socially script our conversation into deeper levels of that human communication. Second, there's also what we give as a feedback loop. So as we're listening to another person, we've been socially sort of more, uh, we've learned social mores and standards that have taught us to give basic feedback moments. I don't know if you folks have got that one friend who's like, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Right? <laughs> Super annoying. Or maybe you've got a friend who's a little bit better at listening, gives you a variety of different feedback cues. Uh-huh. Hmm. Interesting. Well, what about this? You know, giving you a feedback loop that actually tries to facilitate further co conversation. And then finally, of course, we have meta messages, uh, discourse about discourse, conversations about conversations. This particular lecture is actually meta discursive or it is a meta message because we're talking about human communication from a communication standpoint. But the big thing, if there's anything to be taken away from the message, is there's always what we intend to communicate, what we want to communicate. In my mind, this lecture is the most beautiful lecture of all times, but what I'm actually communicating is oftentimes far worse. <laughs> and I'm sure you folks have been there too, right? You really wanted to say something, but it came out just the wrong way. No, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. Ah, can I take it back? And you can never take it back. <laughs> so of course we have the message, and oftentimes what we intend to communicate and what we actually communicate are far, far different from each other. And it's the purpose of this course to try and blend these two together so that what you intend to communicate oftentimes becomes what you actually communicate. Now this isn't the only problem though. So we might have a speaker and a message that are a little bit jumbled, but by the time it gets to the channel, we have so many different opportunities for things to go wrong. So first, let me introduce you to this concept of signal to noise. So the message has a certain powerful signal to it, but the more lean the communication network becomes, the more opportunities for noise to infiltrate the channel, for the signal to go down, for the noise to go up, and for the message to be lost. Now, as far as the textbook is concerned, there are four major different types of noise that are out there. There's physical noise. So as you're watching this video, you might have somebody running up and down the hall, your dog's barking, your baby's crying. All these things would be physical noise that's around you. 
You might have physiological noise, like maybe you just don't hear things very well, you know, you need a hearing aid, or there's some kind of physiological problem with the way in which you interpret sound waves. There might be psychological noise, so maybe you're listening to this YouTube video at three o'clock in the morning, or odds are you're probably listening to it about two hours before the midterm exam. You probably have a lot of different psychological problems that are blocking your ability to sort of tune in and actually listen to this particular lecture. And then finally, there's semantic noise, noise that actually happens with the language itself. I mean, I'm sure all of you folks have had that problem where you're riding shotgun and the driver's saying, hey, hang a right up here, right? Right, no left, right, no! Nah! Because the term right has so many meanings. It could be right as in a direction, it could be right as in correct, it could be right as in a political leaning, it could be right as in even to write something down. There are so many different interpretations of the term right. Oftentimes, we get lost in semantic noise. Now, the big thing about the channel, which is so important for this particular lecture too, is that you have a rich versus a lean communication channel. Now, I'm sure some of you folks before signing up for this class really wondered like, hey, is it really worth the money? Like, why am I paying for this, you know? I'm not in a classroom, I don't get that face-to-face -face interaction. And you've got a point, because you're in a lean communication channel. You have to watch me as a professor in a box. Let me out. <laughs> And in a normal classroom, we'd have a face-to-face -face interaction. You'd be able to come up to me at the end of class, talk to me, be, you know, good two feet away from my face, smell my disgusting breath, right? Get all of my facial expressions, get all of my hand gestures, get all of the essence of human-to-human -human interaction. And that is a rich communication channel. Very, very small opportunities for miscommunication to occur. It's very in your face. This, you know, the actual stimuli is powerful. Now, for most of us, we probably move more into a public speaking situation. So if we were back in the classroom, you know, we'd have some people sitting up front, some people sitting in the back, and the people in the front would probably hear me a little bit better than the people in the back. And then some people in the back would play with their phones. You know, all that stuff that we miss so much. <laughs> but public speaking still has human to human interaction. You still get to see that human, you get to feel their presence. You know? and, and so much of that is lost. When we go further down, into this horrible world of Zoom and teleconferencing and Sorry, I froze there for a second. <laughs> but inside of the teleconferencing world, we lose so much. We, we lose that human interaction. We still get to see a visual representation of the person. You still get to hear me, but something's kind of lost. You know, you, you can't feel my energy, if you will, <laughs> as much as you would if we were back here in the classroom. Now moving even slightly further down, oftentimes when we talk on the phone, we lose a lot too. You know, we lose facial expressions, we lose hand gestures, we lose body movement or kinesics. Over the phone though, we still get a rich auditory channel though. You still get to hear my intonations. Odds are you'll probably pick up on my sarcasm, you'll probably get the timing of my jokes. You know, over a phone, we still have a kind of rich human communication interaction, though probably not as much as when we have teleconferences over Zoom. Now moving down, here, here, oh, this is the bane of my existence. You know, coronavirus killing me off, huh? No big deal. Nuclear war, Psh, please, right? Riots in the streets, tear gas, guns, no, no, that's not the way I'm gonna die. How am I gonna die? I'm gonna die because somebody misinterpreted one of my text messages. No, oh, yeah, you know it, you know, like, like just go back through your texts, right? Last week, maybe last month? But yeah, I bet you, at least in the last month, you had a fight over a text message. Oh, no, I don't really get what you mean. And then you try and fix it with an emoji? Oh, heart, does that make me a better professor? No, right? Why the hell are we throwing around eggplants and peaches? Like, what the heck is wrong with our society? We think this should be our primary means of communication? It's lean, there's nothing there. We're striving to try and get this across. I'm the kind of guy that if you text me more than like five times in a row, I'm picking up the phone and I'm talking to you and what I can't stand are the people who still don't pick up that phone. I know your lazy ass is sitting on a couch watching TV, do 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 right? But no, you won't pick up the phone? Come on, move up, right? And I know some of you were like this too. <laughs> but texting isn't even necessarily the worst, right? Or, or what's even funnier, right? The people who send voice texts, like, you know, like I can't talk to you over the phone, but, but I'll give you like a 50 second voice clip of me, like a like walkie talkie world, what the heck is that? 
Anyways. <laughs> Moving slightly down, we have email, right? Oh, email, right? Actually, this is probably going to end up killing me off, too. Because not only do we have email, it, it's asynchronous. We don't know how long it takes for a person to get back to you via email. It's all dependent upon the other person's circumstances. So, you know, if a person tries to get back to you in 24 hours, seems like the typical norm. But what happens if you email a professor on a Friday night? You know, they might not get back to you all the way till Monday. You know, all these different rules about emailing oftentimes just increases the level of social anxiety that we have about conversations. And that's because I think we've lost too many of these rich communication channels. Back in my day, we used to have office hours where you'd sit down in front of an office for like 30 minutes and wait for the last stupid student to ask their dumb questions so you could walk in and have a good old face-to-face -face conversation. Ah, oh, how I miss those days. Finally, of course, I love how it's G and then mail, <laughs> which you may want to start one up in case you folks need to send over videos to me. But uh, just regular old mail, you know, it's completely asynchronous. We don't even know how long it's going to take a letter, especially in today's day and age with the post office completely on the fritz. But maybe because of its rarity, actually, uh, um, an actual letter might be more powerful, right? Spray a little perfume on it, seal it off with a kiss. Here you go. But of course, asynchronous, you no time frame of what's going to happen, all communication is lost, unless you like drawing emojis, but hey, maybe that's for some of us out there. Finally, of course, after all these opportunities for noise to enter into the communication situation, we eventually get the message down to you folks, the receivers, the listener, the audience that's out there. And much like we have our cute little brain over here, we have another brain over there. You folks are getting this language, it's coming into your ears, you're seeing my visual displays, and you decode that message back into the synaptic firings, the dendrites, the axons, the neurochemicals that are all firing back and forth that gives meaning to the words that I'm actually saying. Now, when you decode that message, remember, you always decode it through your own frame of reference that every individual has a unique frame of reference. It's comprised of your attitudes, your beliefs, and your experiences. Now, your frame of reference can change upon certain in instances. Like if I told you this is going to be on the midterm exam, yeah, this is going to be on the midterm exam, odds are you're gonna pay more attention to it because it goes back into your frame of reference. You wanna get that question right because then you get a good score on the midterm and then you get an A in the class and that A in the class gets you that degree. That degree gets you $2 million over the course of your life. Those $2 million go to the white picket fence, the beautiful little house, the sweet little partner, the 2.3 kids, the 3.2 cars, the 6.2 TVs. <gasps> oh the American dream. <laughs> but remember, we all have these attitudes, these beliefs, these experiences. Maybe you like taking communication because you enjoy communication. You're gonna pay more attention to it because you enjoy that particular major. Maybe you don't really care. This is your A1 click check it off GE requirement. Just get me out of here, I'm done with it. Then you're gonna pay less attention to what I have to say. But all of us have these attitudes, these beliefs and these experiences that affect the way in which our brain decodes that particular level of information. To finish off, remember that this entire model all happens within a context. That the source or the speaker or the message, the channel, the receivers, it all happens within a unique time, a unique place, and a unique event. Depending on when you're watching this, depending on when I'm recording it, depending on what kind of psychological disposition you have, it's all going to affect the way in which you decode this particular message. And contextually, we can never repeat it. So hopefully, when you folks watch this video for the sixth time, it'll have a little bit more of a contextual flair and you can understand a little bit more about the Shannon Weaver or source message channel receiver model of human communication.